At the heart of the U.S.-China trade dispute is an all-out battle to control the technologies of the future. China's bold plans to dominate tech innovation from artificial intelligence to robotics and autonomous cars is reshaping American attitudes toward one of its largest trading partners. In Washington, China is now an adversary. There's a real danger that the technology world could split, splintering supply chains and forcing companies and countries to choose the U.S. or China. I'm Emily Chang. Tonight, for a special broadcast for the Bloomberg New Economy in collaboration with the Asia Society, I'm speaking with a distinguished panel of experts about what is at stake if a silicon curtain falls between the two countries. Can the U.S. and China find a way to manage security concerns without destroying cross-border innovation? Or are we heading for a full-blown technology cold war? So I'd like to welcome Sam Sachs, cybersecurity expert and fellow at New America, Susan Shirk, chair of 21st Century China Center and a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and Joy Tan, senior vice president for public affairs at Huawei, as well as Ken Wilcox of the Asia Society and chairman of Silicon Valley Bank. So I wanted to start with a question for all of you, which is, are we at war with China? Ken? I don't think so, and I don't think we're at war because when I think about the word war, I think of actual hot war. Um, I, but, but we use the word term trade war all the time. We do we do, do that. Um, I think we're just having some conflicts. It's a, it's a question of having yet to figure out how we're going to work with each other effectively. But I would not call this war. Sam, just some conflicts? We've been seeing what I think of as a perfect storm in Washington and Beijing. So in Washington, you've had an overhaul of CFIUS, the review of, of investments into the United States. You've had an overhaul of the export control regime. You've had more scrutiny on Chinese researchers and sciences, and just a broader pressure to unwind supply chains from China. In, on the Chinese side, you have a government under Xi Jinping that is doubling down on reducing reliance on foreign technology suppliers creating what I think is one of the most comprehensive regulatory regimes for the digital economy in the world. These are structural factors which I think are creating an enormous amount of tension. Then you throw into the mix a global campaign to take down Huawei, and this is where we are. Huawei is, Joy, at the center of the storm. Of course, it's been blacklisted by the Trump administration. Many U.S. companies have had to cut off supplies to Huawei, you previously worked in previous affairs, and now you're lobbying for Huawei in Washington, which I imagine isn't the easiest of jobs. What is that like these days? Well, uh, we definitely want to have a productive conversation with the US government, but uh, we're actually not getting a lot of meetings. So it's a challenge for us. We definitely want to understand the government's concerns and create some kind of framework that can alleviate those concerns and build safe and secure networks for the U.S. operators and their consumers. So how about this? Would you say we're in a tech cold war? Yes, Why? I would say we are. I mean, a lot of people would note that this cold war is very different from the U.S.-Soviet cold war because the Soviet Union and the United States had very few economic or technological ties during the first Cold War. But in this Cold War, the two countries are already so intertwined. And now each of them is using that interdependence to create leverage on the other in a way that is a kind of aggressive bargaining, perhaps. But the consequences of it could be really disastrous. So Joy, do you have any indications? Is there gonna be a deal for Huawei or not? Um, we don't know. We certainly hope this situation can be resolved at a timely manner because it's important for Huawei and a lot of our US supp suppliers, Huawei procures $11 billion each year from uh, US suppliers and their businesses are being impacted, not just large telecom, uh, not just like companies like Intel or Qualcomm, but small and medium-sized companies as well. So look, the central question here, the central concern of the United States and the Trump administration is the national security of this country. Can you assure us that Huawei's equipment won't be used for espionage? 
Huawei has been in the business for the last 30 years. And we work with 500 operators around the world and 46 out of the top 50 operators around the world, except the several ones here in the US. And we work with uh, 200 out of the Fortune 500 companies. On a daily basis, our networks support over 3 billion people. We never had a single major security incident. So we have a proven track record. And we actually open ourselves up for uh, testing in the UK, in Germany, in Canada. And all these governments are satisfied with our products and solutions. So there's a proven mechanism that can work. Emily, can I jump in there? Because I would argue, I think there is national security risk from Huawei. But I think that the answer is not, let's dismantle the company. And I think that there are a number of different risks that are often confused. And if we're going to come up with a solution, we can't muddy those risks. And I want to just sort of lay out what those are, because I think there's a lot of confusion around it. So one thing that's often talked about is Huawei gear is, has lots of vulnerabilities, right? This has been documented from the UK, from the Cybersecurity Evaluation Center. It comes up a lot in the media. The problem is every provider has vulnerabilities, and we don't have similar data on Huawei's competitors. There's a difference between a vulnerability, which is sort of inherent in this, in this sector, and an intentional backdoor. And that is what there has been no evidence found of, right? And I think the resistance from European governments has said, look, you're setting a very dangerous precedent, saying, just on the say-so of the US, let's kill this company. The risk of Huawei really is more of a reflection of how do you see China? How do you see the Chinese government? And that's why you're seeing the same people looking, the, the same data sets around the world, but people coming up with wildly different interpretations of that data. Well, and let's talk about some of what has been reported. And sorry, Joy, you're going to get all the tough questions. Um, <clears throat> but that <clears throat> Huawei worked with a Chinese state-owned company to build a wireless network in North Korea. That, that partnership, in fact, went on for years. What can you say to convince us, to convince the United States government, that the Chinese government doesn't have a backdoor into your company when they work with other private tech companies across China? Well, first of all, Huawei is a private company. It is owned by its employees 100%. And the Chinese government doesn't have any ownership in Huawei. And it doesn't interfere with Huawei's business operation in any way. And for the last 30 years, Chinese government has not asked Huawei to engage in any uh, behavior uh, that, is, uh, that will violate our customers' trust. And um, I think it is, there's a, you know, misunderstanding that Huawei can be manipulated by the Chinese government, but it's absolutely not true. Our, our founder actually said, if he, if we get a request from the Chinese, uh, Chinese government, uh, we'll close down the company instead of violating our customers' trust. Ken. I'm skeptical, and I'm skeptical because in my experience in China, the distinction between private companies and public companies is largely a fiction. I think it's a question of the Chinese government utilizing our terminology, the distinction between private and public, mm -hmm. in order to, in a sense, mislead us a little bit. I believe that, there, that uh, functionally, if a private company becomes large enough, it's uh, functionally going to resemble in many, many ways uh, an SOE. So here's a question. Can the US, does the White House have a point? Can the US protect national security and continue to have a strong relationship with China? I think it can. It really depends on how we define the domain of national security. You know, uh, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, in talking about export controls, he said, what you want is a small yard and high fence. OK, small yard means not every advanced technology. Uh, probably, I mean, it wouldn't include, for example, uh, advanced manufacturing necessarily. It wouldn't necessarily include uh, biotech and uh, development of cancer drugs. 
Uh, it wouldn't include all of AI necessarily. So you have to, I think, have a, a more limited definition of the technologies that China's developing through various indigenous efforts and through uh, trying to get advanced technologies from the rest of the world, uh, the ones that are going directly into making the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese military more capable. But if you don't put some boundaries and, and have a small yard, then basically we're engaged in technological protectionism, technological containment of China, and, and definitely the folks in China, that's the way they see this. They think that we're just doing everything we can to slow them down, to slow down their progress in order to maintain our own superior position. Susan, you're on the front lines of what's happening in, in research and what's happening in universities. and. Yes. What is happening? How is this impacting talent? Well, um, so far, uh, the impact is limited. But uh, there's a lot of anticipatory uh, trying to make sure that Chinese students and visiting scholars are not in your laboratory, even though they want the talent. But if NIH or Department of Energy or the FBI is going to uh, come to you and say that uh, this, even though it's fundamental research, even though mo most of it is published right away, there's no classified research that goes on on most university campuses, certainly not at UC San Diego. They're quite nervous. They rely heavily on talented uh, PhD students and postdocs from China. And yet, they're really worried that they could lose their federal grants if they have Chinese, talented Chinese working in their laboratories. Joy, what are the downstream effects in China? What's the impact there on academic institutions, on research, on science? Uh, well, uh, I can't speak too much about uh, the impact on the Chinese universities, but I know uh, for the U.S. universities, a lot of uh, our partners actually are a little bit concerned. And like many other l large uh, global companies, Microsoft, Google, they invest and they collaborate uh, with universities, and Huawei does the same. And we invest about $300 million each year to work with universities around the world. So many folks might dismiss the administration's strategy here as a lot mm -hmm. of bravado and bluster, but does the White House have a point? Well, of course the White House has a point. There's no doubt about that, but if you reside on, on our part of the spectrum, limitations and prohibitions are ultimately going to fail. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to contain technology. It, after all, is an abstraction. It crosses borders. It crosses walls. There is no um, viable containment. If the Silicon Curtain keeps falling, Sam, what are the consequences? So I think when we look at the consequences, a lot of the time the discussion is, what are the costs to China? What are the costs to the US? But what's missing from the discussion is, and I spend time focusing on technology, what are the costs to humanity, yeah. right? And a lot of this transcends US and China. We're talking about technologies that are gonna fundamentally alter human society. Now, there are really hard questions that have to be had though, right? You know, There are ways that technology is being used in China today that are deeply troubling. Let's talk about the use of AI in Xinjiang, you know, to facial recognition of Muslim minorities. But at the same time, you also have Chinese thought leaders thinking about things like AI safety and ethics in ways that I think is missing from the conversation here. It's both, and we have to hold both of those things at the same time in order to understand the whole picture. Ken, how is this impacting cross-border investment? Well, we know that um, right now, uh, cross-border investments relative to just a couple of years ago are at a relative low. And even up until 2010 or 2011 or so, the um, level of Chinese investment in uh, technology in the US was in the single digits uh, in terms of billions. 
And then all of a sudden, right um, on the heels of the Xi Jinping announcement of the China dream, followed by uh, uh, Made in China 2025, suddenly we saw a huge increase. So all of a sudden in 2015, I was getting calls uh, as the retired CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. I was getting calls from SOEs and from so-called private investors, yeah. um, right and left. I started taking these calls and meeting with people. And I was utterly amazed. First of all, there were people arriving that knew nothing about technology in the US and were saying, help me buy technology. Wow. And I was saying, what do you want to buy? And they'd say, we don't care, just technology. And I would say, what form do you want to buy it in? We don't care, any access that yeah. you could provide. And then when you tried to push them a little, it was largely AI, semiconductors, robotics and a few other things, um, supercomputing. Well, it's all these venture funds that the Chinese government was actually creating, including a lot of local ones. And there was clearly a, uh, a government policy to encourage this. Oh, it's and, like, oh, and oh, a lot gosh. of it, and a lot, yeah, and a lot of it, I mean, not all of it was coordinated, but a lot of it was government money, mm -hmm. for sure. And There's massive no amounts of money. You'd have to be insane not to sit there and ask yourself, what does this mean? Well, and I'm not saying it's evil, but you, you really wonder what are the ramifications? What's the significance? Where did it come from? And there's widespread anger, you know, among, no, no, on both sides of the aisle, no matter what your political leanings are about, mm. forced technology transfer, copycatting, Chinese copycatting of, of, of US technology, which is another part of the problem and another part of what the, you know, the, the Trump administration seeming strategy is, is designed to combat. I really think that this decision, this extreme decision to say that, uh, that uh, we could not, embargoing US technology in uh, Huawei equipment, really there was no real justification for that on national security grounds. And it was there, and it's so costly to ourselves. Therefore, it's a symbol of unmitigated hostility toward China. It is kind of a declaration of war against China. And at that point, I think public opinion in China has become much more anti-American. I would like to add one thing to what Susan's saying, and that is that uh, I think that we're, in a sense, if there's a war, it's a propaganda war, and we're losing the propaganda war in China. And I think it's less because of what we're doing um, and more because of how we're doing it. And I hearken back to uh, one of my favorite presidents, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who said that you should uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. I think that our president, Trump uh, speaks loudly and carries, increasingly, Chinese are beginning to think that his stick isn't very big at all. Thank you, Ken, for that colorful metaphor. <laughs> um, Joy, speaking of the blacklisting, Google can no longer ship the latest version of its Android operating system to Huawei, and Huawei is now working on its own operating system. Mm -hmm. What's the progress on that, and can Huawei develop its own mobile operating system to rival Android to rival Apple's iOS. I think right now uh, we're just, you know, there are about 80,000 employees who are working really hard to find alternative solutions for different parts of the business. So uh, in some businesses, we may cut off the non-core products, and in other situations, we may have to use our alternative solution, like a new operating system. I think the operating system is one uh, aspect, but the, the entire ecosystem uh, is, um, is uh, you know, very difficult to build. So we're confident uh, if we have to adopt our own solution, over time we'll be able to do that. Okay, so last question for, for all of you. Um, where is the U.S.-China relationship in a year? Where is the U.S.-China relationship in five years? No matter how this plays out, is it possible to go back to the way things were? Or are we on a fundamentally new path that cannot be changed? Sam. I think we're in uncharted territory now. Um, and there's, there's two scenarios that I see. 
One is going back to what I call the dysfunctional equilibrium. That said, U.S. companies will continue to operate in China. You will have cross-border trade and investment, right? But it'll just be sort of simmering tension. The other is you get you go down a path where you do have a bifurcation. And I don't think it's going to be clear cut because of the interconnection we've talked about. But you're going to be looking at it. It's not just going to be in U.S. and China. What's going to happen in India, for example? You've got WeChat and Facebook and ByteDance, and you have a lot of different companies around the world that are going to be you know, competing for market share um, with maybe incompatible standards. I mean, I think that uh, Xi Jinping could calm things down and, and maybe not go back to the status quo ante, but could stabilize the relationship with the United States if he uh, demonstrated that he's a market reformer, that he actually believes in the market. You know, back in 2013, he uh, had this great third plenum document that was filled with a lot of great words about continuing uh, market reform and opening, and then none of it was ever carried out. China is going to be ambitious. That's inevitable. But there are so many ways that it could pursue its ambitions in a way that is not, uh, not viewed as threatening to other countries, but goes back to uh, the Deng Xiaoping approach of really trying to reassure other countries. Joy, where is the US-China relationship in a year, well, five years, and can we go it will back? Be very hard to say. I think, you know, from a Huawei perspective, we definitely want the US government to clarify our status and then clarify the status for our US suppliers as well. I think <coughs> that, um, <clears throat> that it's highly dependent on who is in uh, which position of leadership where. Uh, because uh, none of these things are static. Um, even in China, where we have a leader apparently for life now, they, uh, life can't last forever. And so I think it really depends on leaders are the ones that make a difference. There are countries that are in a position to play a greater leadership role themselves over time. And I think that they may change the balance and uh, the influence may begin emanating from other quarters. Um, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Sam Sachs, Susan Shirk, Joy Tan, Ken Wilcox. Thank you so much for this conversation today. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you.